wonder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle, and friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. The show's about to start. I'm coming as fast as I can. Wave to the people. Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph. The Steve John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle. I know, but that's hard to spell. One more. Rocky and Peter Peach Fuzz had caught up with a mystery plane bearing Bullwinkle and his weather forecasting bunion. But as they drew near, Bullwinkle's captors aimed a strange weapon back at them. Okay, fire, Hadley. And from the oddly shaped muzzle came a huge cloud. <coughs> hokey smoke, Captain. Yes, it's a hokey smoke screen. I can't see a thing. Never fear, Rocky. I'll just zoom over the smoke. But as usual, Captain Peach Fuzz punched the wrong lever. Instantly, the engine stopped and the plane plummeted toward the ocean. Turn it off, Hadley. They won't give us any more trouble. And the plane with Bullwinkle aboard flew on to its unknown destination. I could have sworn that lever set up. Never mind that now, Captain. We'd better start swimming. Uh, you can swim, can't you? I can't say, really. I've never tried. Uh-oh. But I will, I will. And the Phyllis captain plunged into the sea and straight down to the bottom. Fortunately, Rocky was able to haul him back to the wreckage of the plane. Gee, you sank like a rock. Yeah, it must be the heavy sandwiches I'm carrying. Heavy sandwiches? I picked up this package of sandwiches at the airport. Hey, this isn't sandwiches. It's an inflatable life raft. Oh, fudge. I always do the wrong thing. Yeah, but this time you did the wrong thing the right way. And Rocky fired the cartridge that inflated the portable boat. Well, there it is, Captain. Isn't it a lovely sight? I ordered pastrami on rye. Well, let's start paddling. Stroke, stroke. And the plucky squirrel paddled bravely for hours. Little did he realize that in the other end of the raft, Captain Peach Fuzz was paddling just as bravely in the opposite direction. Stroke, stroke. Wait, wait a minute, Captain. We're not getting anywhere. With me, that's nothing novel. Gee. Now, don't be discouraged, Rocky. I'm not. I'm just worried about Bullwinkle. I sure hope nothing's happened to him. Or to his bunion, either. Not very likely, for at that moment, Bullwinkle's hoof, bunion and all, was reposing on a velvet cushion in the midst of a scene of barbaric splendor. Unfortunately, Bullwinkle couldn't see any of it. He was still unconscious. And then, the mist slowly parted before his eyes. Uh, where am I? I just knew he'd say that, Hadley. Let's get out of here. He's coming, too. Boy, Rocky, what a dream I had. I dreamed it... Hmm, must have done the room over while I was asleep. Does it please you, Master? Kind of wild wallpaper, Rocky, but... Hey, you're not Rocky. I am Kit Mala, oh, Master. Kit Mala? Oh, of course. <laughs> I'm still asleep. You are awake, oh, Lord of the Universe. Lord of the you, lady, you're in the wrong dream. I'm Bullwinkle Moose. Praise be. Glad to know you, Miss Praise be. And now I must tell my father, the king, that you have returned to the living. Yeah, and boy, this is living. Best hotel I was ever in. Is there anything you require, oh great one? Well, if I could just have a cool drink of... <laughs> Man, that's what I call room service. <laughs> His Majesty King Bushwick, the tidy tide. The door was flung open and into the room strode a strange-looking king, followed by a sinister headsman wearing a large axe. 
Well, it looks as if this story might be a short one after all. Yeah, by about that much. We'll find out what happens next time in Block Party or The Happy Headsman. Once upon a time, there was a Pied Piper. He was called a Pied Piper for two very good reasons. One, he smoked a pipe, and two, by some strange method known only to him, he was able to blow pies out of it. Hence the name, Pied Piper. One day, as he was sitting beside the road, whiling away the hours, blowing banana cream pies, a merchant from the city happened along. Say, that's very interesting, what you're doing there. <laughs> the Pied Piper just grinned at the merchant and started blowing blackberry pies. Mm, that's mighty, mighty clever. <laughs> Have you ever thought of going into the pie business, my boy? <laughs> the Piper didn't answer. He merely switched to mince pies. With this kid's talent, I have the feeling that I could make a fortune. So saying, the merchant took the piper by the hand and led him to the city, leaving a trail of pumpkin, apple, and other assorted pies behind. Now, offhand, one would think that this was the start of a beautiful success story, but such was hardly the case. For the merchant opened a little pie shop, and for his very first customer, a near-sighted little fellow walked in and said, A pack of Latakia, please. Latakia? What's that? It's tobacco. But we don't sell tobacco here. We sell pies. And to illustrate, the merchant had the pied piper pipe up a rhubarb pie. Not wishing to smoke a rhubarb pie, the customer departed. This conversation seemed to have a strange effect on the piper. He stood on his head for 24 hours and refused to eat. One week later, another customer entered the store. I would like a peach pie, please. Joyfully, the merchant turned to the piper and instructed him to bake. But unfortunately, instead of a pie, a leaf of tobacco came out of the pipe. What's the matter with you? You were supposed to pipe up a peach pie, not a tobacco leaf. Perhaps I'd best be going. You stay here. I'll try again. The piper smiled and puffed away, and out came a pie, but it was a pie filled with tobacco leaves. Who ever heard of a tobacco pie? <laughs> well, it's uh, the latest thing, sir. You can eat dessert and smoke at the same time. But the customer wanted no part of such a silly thing as that and departed with haste. At that moment, the king, who was quite a gourmet and known for his love of rare, strange foods, was passing the shop and... My, what is that I smell? Why, it's this pie. What kind is it? A tobacco leaf. Tobacco leaf pie? Latakia, isn't it? <laughs> Must be. I am pleased. I hereby dub thee my royal bakers. Tomorrow you will move into the castle and each day bake a tobacco leaf pie for me. Bright and early the next morning they arrived at the castle and before long were called upon to bake their first mm. pie. I have just finished my breakfast, and now to top it off, I should like my tobacco leaf pie. In a jiffy, the Pied Piper piped up a tobacco leaf pie. <laughs> Say, that smells like genuine Latakia again. Oh, yes, sire. Bite? By all means. The king promptly took a huge bite, rolled it around in his mouth, swallowed, and with a poof, disappeared into thin air. Why, his highness has disappeared. Oh, thank goodness. I was afraid he was going to get sick. Now the aroma of the tobacco leaf pie proved to be most irresistible, and the queen insisted upon a taste. But, Your Grace, the king just took one bite and disappeared. You... Oh, that's silly. How could one bite of this delicious-smelling pie make one... Good heavens. Now look what you and your tobacco leaf pies have done. We're responsible for the disappearance of the king and queen. They decided that it would be best to flee before what they had done could be discovered. And so they headed back to the bakery, and a most important decision was made by the merchant. Now look, no more of those tobacco leaf pies. You see... This had a rather strange effect on the Pied Piper, for he proceeded to pipe up tobacco leaf pies by the hundreds. Within the hour, the aroma of these pies had crept into every corner of the kingdom. How, How wonderful! wonderful. Lot of key. Lot of yes. 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 Thousands of people stormed the bakery, and the tobacco leaf pies by the score disappeared, and so did the people, until at last all that remained was the merchant, the piper, and one tobacco leaf pie. 
I get it now. This has all been a mad scheme of yours to rid the kingdom of people. And I, I'm the only people left. Well, I'm not afraid to go. Do you uh, hear? I'm not afraid. Give me that pie. Say, this is good. The piper couldn't believe his eyes. The merchant actually took a bite of the pie and didn't disappear. Fearing that something had gone wrong with his recipe, the piper took a bite of the pie himself and promptly disappeared. But yes, the, the recipe was all there. Which is more than could be said for the piper. <laughs> yuck, yuck. But I don't understand. Everybody in the kingdom disappeared when they took a bite of that strange pie. Why didn't you? Are you kidding? I don't believe in all those fairy tale hocus pocuses, witches, evil spells, sleeping beauties, magic pies. Bah! It's all a, a lot of. Poof. <laughs> America's foremost authority on space, because his head is full of it, Mr. Know-It-All. Today I will discuss how to fix a flat and retire your car. Most people will go a long way to avoid fixing a flat, to a service station even. There is more than one way to handle this unpleasant chore. For example, the Bullwinkle Van Moose method. Oh, drat. Now I'll have to use the spare car, that is. However, the wise motorist knows how to change a tire. This is a simple operation, and a reasonably intelligent 12-year-old can do the job. But since I don't see one, I'll have to take a crack at it myself. At this point, I'd like to demonstrate the first thing the motorist does when he has a blowout. He places the jack under the bumper, like so, and with an easy pumping motion, he raises the wheels off the ground. Well, if we can't raise the wheels, the only thing to do is lower the ground. We take off the hubcap, loosen the wheel nuts, and put them in the hubcap so we don't lose them. Only trouble is, I keep losing the hubcap. Now, we take the spare out of the trunk. What's the matter, Bullwinkle? No spare? Oh, there's a spare, all right, Brock. Problem is, it's a spare flat. What does the motorist do in a situation like this, Bullwinkle? I think that's obvious, Rock. He becomes a pedestrian. Well, you can't get a flat tire that way. No, just flat feet is all. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. But... See? Nothing up must leave. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat. And now it's time to meet Mr. Peabody. <laughs> Hello again, Peabody here. Sherman and I are on our way into the past, as usual, and today's journey should be an exciting one. What shall I set the way back for, Mr. Peabody? Date-wise, Sherman, set it for July 14th, 1865. And the place? A steep peak in the Alps, 14,780 feet high. It is called the Matterhorn, and we shall be there when it is conquered by Lord Francis Douglas. It was a short journey, and a cold one. Before we could catch our breath, we were standing with Lord Douglas and his party in the town of Zermatt. Towering over us was the mighty Matterhorn. Oh, this infernal delay has worn my nerves to a frazzle. Are you ready to make your ascent, Lord Douglas? Have been, you know, since three this morning. Why are you waiting? Because no one has said go. You mean you and your men have been standing here all that time waiting for somebody to say go? Yes, I suppose that does sound a trifle odd to you. Sherman, do Lord Douglas a favor and say go. I'd be glad to, Mr. Peabody. <clears throat> go. Underway at last, the Douglas party lost no time in climbing. We followed their progress with a spyglass and were startled five minutes later to see they were already halfway up. That must be some kind of record. Yes, it would be, if it were Lord Douglas. Huh? Look again, Sherman. You'll see that Lord Douglas is in a race for those climbers halfway up or a party made up of Italians. How can you be sure? Look closely, my boy, and you'll see... I don't see anything different about them except their snowshoes. That's it, Sherman. Those snowshoes are pizzas. Suddenly the door of our chalet burst open and in stumbled one of Lord Douglas's guides. Lord Douglas is doomed! Before he could elaborate, the guide collapsed. What are you 
suppose he met Mr. Peabody? Only one way to find out, Sherman. We must scale the Matterhorn ourselves. Well, the climb was a simple one for Sherman and me, due to the fact that we lived in my penthouse apartment, you know. And for exercise, we would scorn the use of the elevator every so often and use the stairs. Well, we reached Lord Douglas's camp in no time at all. And I say we turn back. But you can't let the Italians beat us, old boy. It isn't the Italians, old man. It's the... It's what, Lord Douglas? The abdominal snowman. The who? A creature who inhabits snow-covered mountains, Sherman, and throws snowballs at people. My words were followed by a bombardment of the aforementioned objects. How the devil can I conquer the Matterhorn with a snowball in my... face? Sherman, being all boy and a yard wide, was all for sending up a bombardment of his own. I had other ideas, though, and set the party to constructing three snowmen of our own. This sure is fun, Mr. Peabody. And a half hour later, we were rid of the abdominal snowman and free to resume the climb, for under my direction, we had erected a bridge game consisting of three snowmen, a table, a pack of cards, and four chairs. It wasn't long before our attacker joined the game. And if I knew bridge, this game would last a long time. By George, that was positively wizard. Onward! The ascent continued, and although no one voiced it out loud, each man harbored a fear the Italians would reach the summit first. Unfortunately, as we rounded a bend, we found the Italians had run into bad luck and were quitting. It's all his fault, the Luigi here. I'm telling him once, I'm telling him a thousand times. Last a hundred feet to the top, you gotta climb with rope. What does he bring? A spaghetti. And the meatballs. We'd give you some of our rope, old boy, but we don't have any. I guess we can't get to the top either. Oh, that's it too bad. Tell you what, you can have a nice dish of hot spaghetti. The spaghetti gave me an idea. I promptly tied the ends together and doused the whole thing in snow. The spaghetti hardened and was as good as the strongest rope, if not better. Lord Douglas, Sherman and I were the only ones willing to scale the summit with spaghetti, and so while the others watched, we made a final assault. The spaghetti held up, and it wasn't long before the three of us were standing on the top of the Matterhorn. Warmed by the climb, Lord Douglas removed his fur parka and hung it over a scrawny tree. I'll give you three guesses, Sherman, as to what type of tree that is. Pine? No. Oak? No. I give up, Mr. Peabody. What kind of tree is it? <laughs> My boy, that is a Douglas fir. Last time you remember, Bullwinkle woke to find himself in a magnificent apartment with his weather forecasting bunion perched on a velvet cushion. Boy, this is the life! But Bullwinkle wasn't so sure when the door opened and a strange-looking little king entered. Greetings, oh font of wisdom. Where, where? That's you, Jack. Ooh. We have brought you from your own land to advise and counsel us. How come that? On account of your fortune telling bunion is how come that, friend. My bunion? Praise, Praise be. be. Hey, what's this all about? Uh, hand me that, that great scroll, Piranha. And from the enormous document, King Bushwick read Bullwinkle a fantastic story. It all started some years ago when a U.S. Navy destroyer was passing a small tropic island. On the fantail of the ship stood a fearless figure alert and ready beside a row of sinister containers that looked like garbage cans. Of course, in reality, they were powerful death charges. Suddenly, the command came. Fire one. And Seaman Amos Bushwick fired a... a now, wait, that's not a death charge. That's... Yeah, it really is a garbage can. You never can tell, can you? Fire two. Again and again, Seaman Bushwick swung the heavy cans, emptying them with true Navy skill and accuracy. All except the last one. Ow! Man, overboard! Of course, an intensive search was made of the area, but Amos failed to turn up, and so was listed as lost at sea. But in reality, he was very much alive. Hey, here I am. Too late, the Navy vessel sailed away, never to return. Okay, just for that, I'll stay here. And the castaway lost no time in making himself at home on the tiny island. First, he named it after his old hometown, 
I hereby name you no green paint. Then he did everything he could to make the island a little Brooklyn in the South Pacific, including language lessons. Okay, you guys, what's this? Omaha. Nah, this is a bird. Now say after me. Bide. Bide. Goyle. Goyle. Wime. Wime. Jerk. 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 All right, let's solve it. Okay, wise guy, what was that? Joink, joink! All right, already. So appreciative were the natives of all this that they made Amos King of New Greenfront, and he took the name of King Bushwick of 33rd Avenue. Bushwick 33rd for short. And for his coronation, his loyal subjects presented him with the greatest gift at their command. Observe, Your Majesty, genuine ogle egg. No, can't. Well, let's scramble it. But strangely enough, when the eggshell was cracked, the only thing that emerged was a small slip of paper. What is this, a gag? No gag, King. This genuine fortune egg from genuine Oogleboid. Oogleboid? Yes, high on a mountain top above New Green Perns sat that strange and legendary creature, the Oogleboid, so called because of its strange cry. <coughs> the Oogleboid laid only one egg a month, but that one was a whopper. So large were oogle eggs that they always fell out of the oogle bird's nest and rolled down the mountainside where they were sought eagerly by the natives. For each one had a real, honest-to-goodness fortune inside it. This is all very interesting, if they try for long. But what's it got to do with me and my fortune-telling bunion? Oh, that's simple. You are our new oogle bird. I gonna be a boy, bird? Well, it looks as if Bullwinkle has a tough job ahead of him. Yeah, especially if I gotta grow feathers. We'll find out next time in The Wizard Biz or Bullwinkle Lays an Egg. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Ooh.